Hello everyone, welcome to the webinar for the Day of Women in Science, organizing by the IOES Junior Community in collaboration with the Iranian Immunology Society and the French Society for Immunology. So briefly, we want to introduce you the IOES Junior Community launching last uh, June. So we are here to build a community to share, vocalize and overcome obstacles for early career immunologists. To do so, we are promoting and connect early care researchers at the international level. We are here to help and support the creation of junior national or regional immunology society, specifically from low to middle income countries or crisis region. We are also involved in the education and training environment. And uh, I invite you to visit the website of Frontier in Immunology, uh, where the IUES junior community have a specific session for the junior immunologists we want to publish in Frontier. We are also involved uh, to join force to highlight the field of immunology as the day of immunology. But this is one of example of how we connect our community to uh, senior scientists. So um, in the last November, in the IOES CAPT International Meeting, we organized a meet and greet with the Nobel laureate keynote. And it was a great opportunity for our members to discuss science, but also career development. And just a uh, last um, slide to introduce you the next uh, IOES International Meeting 2025 in Vienna. And uh, we are here today to celebrate women in science and specifically Iranian women immunologists. Uh, so I give the voice to uh, the Vice President uh, Mernaz Mezdaghi uh, of the Iranian Society of Immunology to um, introduce the, this uh, special day. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. As the time in Tehran is, is now afternoon, maybe your country's morning, mm -hmm. evening or night. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you uh, from different countries and thank you for joining us today. Uh, it is an honor for us to launch, to launch this fascinating webinar on the occasion of uh, Women in Science International Day. Uh, I would... Oh... Uh... Uh, I'm sorry, it takes time for the slide to be shared. So, it's a great pleasure to meet you today online uh, and celebrate the... Right, uh, Nashin, I think we, we lost uh, Mernas for a second. Uh, so maybe we can continue with the next uh, speaker as we. Hello, Mernas, can you hear us? Can you hear yeah, us? Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Ah. I don't know what's wrong with the slides. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, and the slides are there, but okay, uh, yeah, we lost yeah, you for okay. a second. So maybe it's yeah. best if you can yeah, close your okay. camera for a moment and, yeah. and, and continue, please. Okay. I will, I will share the slides for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I wish to uh, explain a little bit about the history of this day. In December 2015, the UN declared 11th February as the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. The main reason for this declaration was to encourage more girls and women to take up jobs in the field of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, also known as STEM subjects, and to promote equal and full access uh, and participation of women and girls in STEM fields. Can you change my slide, please? Okay, no. Uh, the previous one. Uh, the day, the day is every day. This international day is implemented by UNESCO in collaboration with UN Women. Both organizations work with national governments, intergovernmental organizations, civil society partners, universities, and corporations to order to achieve the shared goal of promoting the role of women and girls in science and celebrate those already successful in the field. I am very happy to share that IUIS is a pioneering organization in this area. IUIS Gender Equality Committee was established at 2010 IUIS Council meeting in Kobe, Japan during the Congress 
So you see six years before implementation of the day by UN IUIS uh, was thinking about it, and of course, even earlier. Uh, Antonio Guterres, UN Secretary General, uh, has published a message today, on the, uh, I mean yesterday, on the occasion of Women in Science Day, that I think it is worth reading as it includes all the different aspects I wish to cover today. Gender equality in science is vital for building a better future for all. Unfortunately, women and girls contribute to face systemic barriers and biases that prevent them from pursuing careers in science. This deprives, deprives our world of great talent. Today, women make up only one third of the global scientific community, obtaining less funding, fewer publishing opportunities, and, fear, and fewer senior positions at, uh, at top universities than men. In some places, women and girls have limited or no access to education, an act of self-harm for the society's concern and a terrible violation of human rights. From climate change to health to artificial intelligence, the equal participation of women and girls in scientific discovery and innovation is the only way to ensure that science works for everyone. Closing the gender gap requires dismantling gender stereotypes and promoting role models that encourage girls to choose science, developing programs to support the advancement of women in science, and cultivating a working environment that nurtures the talents of all, including women members of minority communities. Women and girls belong in science. It's time to recognize that inclusion fosters innovation and let every woman and girl fulfill her true potential. This is actually, uh, Today, or better said yesterday, is the ninth year that the day is celebrated. Can you please change the slide? Every year has a theme, and the theme, no, the next please. And the theme for 2024, <laughs> I'm sorry, the next, okay, please next. And the theme for 2024 is Women and Girls in Science Leadership, a new era for sustainability. And I believe, to have a, a sustainable, uh, for sustainable development, we need presence of women in leadership positions. Women should believe in themselves uh, and be prepared to embrace and thrive in leadership roles. And of course, the society uh, should welcome and uh, desire for it. Next slide, please. During <coughs> the marvelous Congress in Cape Town, many of you may be present there. Uh, I and Nushin agreed to organize this event. And uh, Miriam Merwad kindly supported us and uh, encouraged us. And despite facing several uh, challenges, I'm very happy that we made it and we are here today. Uh, this webinar, as Nushin, uh, Nushin uh, told, is a joint webinar of the Iranian Society of Immunology, French Society of Immunology, and IUIS Junior Committee. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what we did in Iranian Society of Immunology, uh, we uh, published an announcement. I'm sorry that this poster is in Persian, but I'm gonna explain it. Uh, we made an announcement uh, for, women, for women Iranian scientists to send their CVs and their scientific contributions and apply to give a lecture today and present their uh, research result. We received nine applications. The applications were reviewed by Iranian Society of Immunology and uh, Dr. Nafis Ismail, who is an associate professor and head of department in Isfahan Medical University, was selected and, yeah, and she will be awarded uh, the pre-registration for the next Congress in Vienna. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so this is the program for today. After my and Nushin's introduction, uh, we will have our, our first speaker. Our first speaker is Professor Miriam Merad. She's an inspiring, passionate woman scientist. As she describes herself, she's an Algerian, French, American woman immunologist. And besides her research, her high research profile and her position as IUIS president, I think she's the perfect choice to start our webinar today. 
Afterward, we will ask uh, Behazin Kombadia. Uh, she is an Iranian French scientist, uh, uh, recently moved to industry, and she's going to talk about uh, immunology behind roots and doses of vaccine that I'm really looking forward to hear. No, please, the previous one, it is not finished yet. And our next speaker will be uh, Monir Torabi. She is a PhD student. She has gathered the history of immunology and women immunologists in Iran. And I am sure you will enjoy her lecture. And as the last speaker, Nafisa from Esfahan will present her research results about NK and car NK therapy in solid tumor. Afterwards, we will have plenty of time for question and answers, and we will announce two awards. Next slide, please. Besides our scientific activities, we had also a social activity. In our, again, it is in Persian, but I'm gonna explain. Uh, in our gender equality community, we announced a call for a photographic contest with the idea that when we talk about the scientists, usually the minds think about a man, <laughs> and we want to change it to see uh, the women scientists and uh, to change this type of idea of thinking about a man when we hear scientists. We received several interesting photos. You can see some of them here. And in the last part of the webinar, we are going to announce the winners. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much for joining us today and having the same concern as we have. And I'm sure you will enjoy this webinar and the program today, and we can move forward together. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Actually, most of you know her very well. Miriam Merwad is a physician scientist. She received her MD degree in Algeria and completed her residency in hematology and oncology in Paris. And then he received a PhD degree in immunology in Stanford University. Now she's a professor at Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and director of Precision Immunology Institute. Her field of research is cancer immunology and immunotherapy. And she has published several papers, many of them in prestigious journals such as Science, Nature, and Cell. She's also a member of US National Academy of Science and National Academy of Medicine. Uh, Miriam, it is really a great honor uh, for us to have you today. We all know how busy you are, and thank you for your time and uh, joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Merna. Can you guys hear me? Can yeah. you hear me well? Yeah. All right. So, so first, happy, happy International Women and Girl in Science Day to all. And I, I couldn't be more thrilled to spend this day with the Iranian immunology community or women immunology community, who I think exemplify really the engagement, engagements of women and, and their relentless fight uh, to really improve the scientific community. I think your slides were very inspiring, Mernaz, and you summarized very clearly, you know, the, the contribution and, uh, and the importance of, uh, the importance to have a representation of both gender in any community, whether it's in science or in medicine or in society. So it's a pleasure for me to be here today. And uh, I thought I will just discuss with you a little bit my background. And uh, I think because it shows uh, that very similar to what Werner has described, you know, I had to change country to, to somehow develop. And I, I, um, I wish I, I was able to develop in my own place. I don't know whether I can have my slides can I my slide or should I share myself? Oh, maybe I can share. Sorry, I can share. I thought you were presenting them. I will share my screen. Sorry. Can you see my slides? Can you yes, see my perfect. slides? All right. Yes, perfect. All right. So I, uh, I was born in Paris because my parents were studying there, but I was raised in Algeria. You know, it's also often said that I was a French citizen, but I became French citizen, French citizen much later. So I was just born, and a few months later, I went back to Algiers, a beautiful uh, city on the Mediterranean coast. And I uh, grew up there, and I started medicine there. But unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, there was a civil war. A civil war started in, in 1991 between 
fundamentalist group and our and um, and the military and it became impossible really to to stay there and many of us uh, had to leave and so i left i left for france uh, where i finished medicine it broke my heart i have to say to uh, leave my country it's very difficult to start in a new place and i finished medicine and i did a residency and fellowship in um, hematology and oncology and then I did a master in immunology because I was quite interested in, um, in fact, the, the immune response against cancer, as I will describe in a minute. And then because of this master, I became very interested in immunology science, uh, and I decided to do a PhD. I obtained a fellowship from the Association Research Contre le Cancer from France, and with this uh, fellowship, I went to Stanford University, where really I discovered um, a phenomenal scientific community is uh, America has this way of, of really believing that science can transform medicine in a way that I've never seen before. And I became really very excited to belong to that group of scientists. I stayed a little bit more to do a short postdoc and then I was recruited at Mount Sinai, a medical center in New York where I've been since there and now. I am a chair of the immunology department and, and the director of the Precision Immunology Institute that, that really strives to harness the immune system to treat all human diseases. Okay, so I just want to explain that I, I moved. It was not very easy uh, to, to move countries. Uh, um, and I did it because, uh, well, first, I, I, I don't think I would have left Algeria if it was not for the war. but. But once you leave your country, then potentially you 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 can you you are not attached you know to any other place. And I, I really followed the interest uh, and, and 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 the opportunity that were offered by all the different places. In any case, I I uh, have now uh, colleagues in um, in these three continents, and and I feel I belong to the global scientific community. And maybe we don't have to belong to one one place. I just want to highlight an important choice I made in my career, which really transformed my life. And this uh, is the one to become a physician scientist. So when I started medicine, I, I really liked uh, uh, treating patients, but I was very touched by really the bleak outcome of cancer patients at that time. Uh, uh, the early 90s, uh, uh, really, <laughs> the outcome of uh, cancer patients was uh, was not was quite bleak we didn't have access to targeted therapy not access to immunotherapy and all patients with metastatic diseases were dying so i became convinced that we had to do more we had to do differently and i became uh, uh, very very inspired by the success of allogenic uh, allergenic bone marrow transplant to treat um, him malignancy. So I realized, I suppose, the power of the immune system to eliminate cancer cells. And this is what I, I uh, this way I, I started to study immunology. And I met a fantastic woman in science, Laurence de Vogel, who at that time were just coming back from the US where she had done, she was also an oncologist, and she moved to the US to do a PhD in immunology. And she was describing to me some of the research she had done there. And she really pushed me uh, to go. I was very insecure to go to the US. I had moved already from Algeria to France, and it's not easy to really adapt in a new country. But but thanks to Laurence, I think she gave me the courage to move again. So I went to Fran I went to the U.S. and um, and I learned again another culture, another language, and uh, and I had to integrate in another community. And this exposure to three continents to me really revealed gaps between scientific infrastructure and culture, you know, between the three continents. And I suppose this is um, what uh, really. Maybe was behind my decision to to become you know part of the IOS communities to really think about these gaps, right? And really, my role now is to define gaps, gaps in immunology science, and think about framework to reduce these gaps. So I've been thinking about this quite a bit, and I think it's important to define gaps in science and gaps in care, right? Because ultimately. What we want to close also is, is gaps in clinical care. 
So there are many gaps, you know, across countries. There are gaps in knowledge where I have been. So in my field, for example, extraordinary advances, uh, advances in our understanding of the biology of I, I should have said immunology science, but I'm going to just focus on tumor, which is something I said in my laboratory. So if you look at the biology of tumor and its microenvironment, you know, there is extraordinary advances that are made in some part of the world that are not enough shared with the rest of the world. There is, for example, also limited knowledge on the tumor genetic landscape and host genetic, which control the host response to cancer, right? from population of non-European ancestry. So most of the knowledge that we have on cancer and in microenvironment, it really comes from uh, uh, people from non-European ancestry. There is also a gap in drug development. You know, across diseases, there is an overrepresentation of European ancestry in drug trial, which means that the drug that works in diseases comes from studies that, that were done in uh, uh, people from European ancestry. Right, which doesn't reflect entirely right, the therapeutic benefit of these drugs. There is, of course, gaps in access to therapeutics, especially for biologics, which include immunotherapy, which are mostly affordable by high-income countries. And these gaps promote health inequality and impede the discovery of novel therapy that can benefit patients globally. So, so what kind of framework we can define to reduce this gap, right? Uh, and so we've defined, you know, a few frameworks. The first is an building tailored educational program that pivots from generic training. You know, we have, and I think there are several educational programs across the world that have been done, you know, for decades, you know, by, by people who care, care about, you know, global education. Now we have new tools, you know, to train, and these new tools have really expanded after COVID. You know, where there is this online capability that have, you know, like like the one we have today, that enhance and strengths that that really enhance our ability to communicate, and we can harness those to really start to re, uh, uh, to to build this educational interaction and build and strengthen knowledge base, you know, among immunology communities and then those type of educational online communities can maximize the impact of potential on-site interaction which are also important to share knowledge we also have to educate the educators right? so it's very important that we spend time with faculty across the world and not directly with trainees because educators are the one that could could then uh, uh, really spread knowledge right and uh, spread knowledge and 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 really affect and do all the outreach that are necessary locally we need to also focus on hubs of excellence rather than starting from scratch everywhere we need to identify where you know in each country that are in need what is the place where we can build and not build from scratch because it's easier to really uh, build on top of something that already exists uh, that can then become a hub for the local trainees then we need to tailor our educational programs to need right curricula need to be defined in partnership with local educators that tell us you know what really what are the gap in knowledge in that specific countries and often in educational program what i say at least and those that i contributed to i'll give the time same type of course you know across the world not knowing really whether i'm relevant or not so we need to be always questioning ourselves is what we are doing relevant to the local community we are talking to then i think more than education it's very important to train through research right and americans know how to do that you know so they are educational uh, uh, you know the, that that uh, book education is really much reduced compared to the hands-on you know educational program because we really learn about science when we are experimenting and uh, so training through research activities, emphasizing hands-on experience, emphasizing practical application of biology. And when we do, we know when we think about experimenting in a local country, this is where we realize gaps, right? Gaps in the research infrastructure. So what we can do then is focus on building local and sustainable capacity to do research. You know, we will adapt to the research community and potentially expand upon it but we need to expand upon it in a sustainable manner. 
you know, what I see, at least in my country in Algeria, where I go and, and teach you know, every year, is that it's easy for uh, you know, some center to purchase a very big piece of equipment and maintain it for a few years, but it's much more difficult to sustain that piece of equipment because of costs, you know, reagent costs, etc. So we need to think, you know, if we want to for a serious about global partnership, what we need to do is really understand how we can build sustainable research endeavor or, or, or clinical research endeavor in the countries in need. And then we need to focus on uniqueness, you know, at these places. So if we are to engage with, let's say, Algerian immunology community, so what do I want? What is unique in <clears throat> Algeria that will make it interesting for all to, uh, to study or engage into a research endeavor? And, uh, and, uh, and the most important is really a harness, right? The clinical core that are, more, that are most distinct and prevalent, you know, in each country. So for example, primary immunodeficiencies that may have studies, primary immunodeficiencies are often unique to the places because of, you know, the hosgenesis of the place or the exposure of specific environment. And, and um, it really, it's, it's quite interesting to really study and that type of knowledge really benefit the entire community. Finally, it's very important to define metrics of success in everything that we do, right? Whether it is an educational program or research program or the type of uh, you know, seminar that we do, are we relevant? You know, are we making an impact, assessing impact and defining metrics of success uh, is, is important for all scientists, important for us to move forward. So what is the uniqueness, you know, in Iran community? There are extraordinary talent, right? Extraordinary talent that we need to harness, you know, we need to harness and bring to the scientific community. Extraordinary talent among human, women scientists, many of whom I met, in fact, in Cape Town. There's also a unique population of patients with immune disease or inflammatory disease, you know, this is driven by how genetic, you know, different exposure, environmental exposure in different country or, or also because of unique diets, right? Each country has its own uh, um, diet uh, and environment and, and these, we know, affect the development of inflammatory disease. There is therefore enormous discovery opportunities to discover novel pathophysiology of disease and novel immune targets. And this can lead to an additional market that can attract, which is attractive to researchers, but not only also attractive to industry and attractive to investors. So all of us will be very interested to study, you know, uh, inflammatory diseases among Iranian uh, patients. And so now I'm going to finish by by really in a high level uh, describe to you a framework that we built at Sanai to. Uh, discover novel immune target of disease. Okay, so it's important to realize that the immune system has a major role in virtually all human disease, right? From cancer to metabolic disease to neurodegenerative disease to aging, we know that the inflammatory component, whether it is causative, like in autoimmune disease, or reactive, like in metabolic disease or like in atherosclerosis, can modify disease outcome. And really, the, the, I believe the biggest revolution in medicine in the last decade is the realization that drugging the immune systems can be a curative. Right. We've seen the success of anti-cytokine therapy for the treatment of inflammatory disease, for the big success of COVID, of the vaccines to stop the, the COVID pandemic, and the extraordinary success of checkpoint blockade that has transformed cancer care. So I also think that now it is possible to group all diseases in two groups, right? Those with an overactivating activated immune system. So for example, autoimmune disease, atherosclerosis, metabolic disease, aging, and those where the immune system is suppressed, as we see in infection or in cancer patients. And the moonshot challenge of the years to come is to learn how to re-engineer the immune system to enhance beneficial inflammation without compromising the immune system's ability to fight tumor and pathogen. 
for example, in the case of cancer, how can we enhance tumor immunity without inducing tissue damage? So can we enhance that immune uh, response in cancer lesions, right? but without inducing autoimmunity? So uh, to do that and to really understand you know, the contribution of this inflammatory component in disease, we heavily invested in technology to map inflammatory component of disease. And uh, what we did is we strengthened biobanking program that will enhance sample collection of blood, but also disease lesions, tumor or inflammatory bowel disease or atherosclerosis. So we started to collect these atherosclerosis lesions, for example, during gonderectomy and really store them uh, for, for, large, for um, profiling studies. We enhance our so sample storage capabilities, which were not as developed as, for example, northern European countries. We enhance our sample management systems, our metadata annotation, and database accessibility. We really made our database accessible to all basic scientists, encouraging them to uh, uh, really study human samples. And then we invested quite significantly in technology, a technology that will enable us to really understand that immune component, going from organ imaging to really molecular mapping. And there have been an explosion of single cell technology that enables us to really understand with extraordinary granularity the composition of immune cell at the single cell level in a tissue. So now it's going to be possible to understand how these immune cells are organized and what is their program, you know, across different diseases. So <clears throat> thanks to all this technology, we started to really describe atlases, atlases of disease, you know, from cancer to inflammatory bowel disease uh, to atherosclerosis. And when you have access to these atlases, then it becomes much easier to hypothesize, right, on potentially pathophysiology. So we, uh, now this platform that we've been is part of several uh, big uh, initial consortia, you know, from cancer to, uh, to inflammatory disease consortia that really help, uh, uh, you know, clinicians develop these uh, atlases across all diseases. Now, specifically in cancer, we built what we call the neoadjuvant research group to evaluate therapeutics. And the goal of this group is really to harness, you know, surgical resection. You know, there's a lot of resections that are made of this early tumor that I have not yet metastasized. And we thought we are going to explore that setting to really first understand the immune component of treatment-naive tumor. So there are no confounding variables. But also, in the pre-surgical setting, we could potentially expose tumor to immunotherapeutic or specific therapeutic combination, and then study changes to that treatment. And when you do that, what you could do, what you are doing really is an experiment in patient while potentially benefiting the patient. So now we will use this technology to study the tumor lesions before and after exposure to treatment, and we will compare those patients that responded. So here the response is defined at the pathological level, we will compare patients that responded to this therapy and those that didn't respond, okay? And when you do that, what you, you can identify modules, you know, molecular programs that really correlate, right, to res, uh, uh, that correlate with response. And we can hypothesize that those are driver of response or resistance. But to do that, we had to engage our own, own you know, entire scientific and medical community at Tana, it was not very very easy. You know, we really had to change the culture uh, uh, there. And we started to organize, for example, medical, uh, well, immuno-oncology group that included basic, basic immunologists and, and, uh, and, and, and medical oncologists. And together we will define and we will fight and define what questions we really want to ask. Now, for example, I wanted to start by asking, what is the molecular mechanism of resistance to PD-1 blockade? And many of my colleagues told me, oh, well, medical, you know, it's known, and, you know, I want to tell you something about sexy. And, and, and yet we didn't have, you know, a good understanding of the basics, right? So this is the kind of discussion where we say, let's start from scratch. Let's understand, you know, yes, 
checkpoint blockade is being used for a decade, but we still don't understand the mechanism of response or, of resist, or resistance to this drug. In fact, we don't understand mechanism of resistance to drugs that have been used for, for decades. You know, for example, Remicade, for example, aspirin. We don't know how aspirin works really in many cases. So now we can, with this new technology, we can understand the you know, mechanism of response and resistance and then really uh, uh, discover novel target of disease. And But really to understand this, we need to work with surgeons, with interventional radiologists to really build a tissue pipeline. It's very important to build pipeline of tissue that is that are relevant and that are, are also that you can study. So we need to, uh, we had to spend a lot of time with interventional radiologists explaining to them that they have to biopsy patients and give us enough tissue so that we can do all these studies. And we need to, we had to recruit novel interventional radiologists who are interested in research. And, um, and this is how you change culture. And then of course, those issue will be built in, in this uh, immune monitoring platform that we've built. This is where we make hypotheses and these hypotheses are then shared with basic scientists that will really uh, probe questions in animal models. So I'm going to give you an example of one study. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll um, okay, I will finish here. Uh, probably I had, I think, two more slides, but I will go fast. This is the study that we've done, we finished recently, where we exposed patients with uh, liver cancer to two doses of PD-1 blockade, right? PD-1 is a molecule that is expressed in T cells that are infiltrating the tumor lesions, and we believe stop, you know, uh, 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 stop the activity of T cells. So when you block PD-1, T cells are reactivated. So we, uh, but PD-1 blockade was never uh, tried uh, in patients prior to surgery. And here in this first study that we published with my colleague Tom Maron in the Lancet GI, we showed that approximately 28% of patients in this very terrible cancer, which is called hepatocellular carcinoma, responded only to immunotherapy. We were not touching the cancer cells. Two doses only of PD-1 blockade led to significant response in this terrible cancer. So that was very encouraging. And now we are expanding this trial to add other uh, reagents, including uh, potentially other immunotherapy regimens. Okay, so now we had 28% of response. We tried to understand what, uh, why patients, some patients responded, why some didn't. And then we identify that those that responded had a specific spatial organization of immune cells. You know, when the T cells were close to a dendritic cell, they are more likely to be reactivated by this PD-1 blockade. So now we are working on this organization and understand how we can trigger this type of organization in cancer. And now we are also a colleague of mine. So this was done by my lab in collaboration with another laboratory led by Alice Kemphorst, a, a fantastic Brazilian woman immunologist at Sanai. Now another colleague of mine, you know, so the data that we uh, built here, you know, where we profile the tumor lesions before and after PD-1 blockade with all the technology possible. So this is where uh, Alice and I were studying T cell and dendritic cell, and another colleague of ours with the same data set that we generated was studying B cell response to cancer, and he identified that patients that develop high antibody response were uh, those that responded to, to PD-1 blockade. And that was surprising because antibody response was, was not thought to be really contributing to anti-tumor immunity. And uh, Sasha is now trying to submit this study. And then another uh, uh, study that originated from my group here, we looked at myeloid response, macrophage, which is like our macrophage contributing to resistance or, um, or response. And we identify a macrophage population that in fact was enabling response to PD-1 blockade. So uh, this is an example of how with one study of 21 patients, which I should have said that it's 21 patients, we were able to make a lot of discovery thanks to the technology that enables us to study with great depth our human samples. And this is the things that we can do, in fact, in many parts of the world. It is, I think, another example where we discovered by profiling lung cancer, a molecular program that suggested that IL-4 
I4, which is a cytokine often uh, 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 produced in allergic setting, was somehow being expressed, you know, we, well, or, or signaling through uh, immune cells. So we were very surprised. We started to, uh, we went back to animals, and uh, we we saw that also in lung cancer, in animal model, this I4 signaling module was present. So we started to treat mice with lung cancer with uh, uh, an IL-4 antibody blockade, and we saw great response. Okay, this was surprising. Now we know that IL-4 was a major driver of what we call type 2 responses, uh, but there was also an antibody developed by Regeneron, a company here in upstate New York, to block this IL-4 receptor signaling, and this has FDA approval in severe asthma and severe atopic dermatitis. So we decided to bring this IL-4 blockade that was, in fact, approved for allergic disease, and we put it in lung cancer patients. This is just because we saw that IL-4 receptor signaling module first in patient, then we tested it in mice, and now we designed this clinical trial because we repurposed the drug, the drug was safe and approved, so we uh, just wired a, a specific request to the FDA to try it in cancer patients, and they agreed. So we tried it in lung cancer patients, and in 21 patients, that were that have re uh, 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 relapsed after PD-1 blockade. We put this. We we continue the PD-1 blockade that was not sufficient to uh, uh, treat patients. And now we introduce this IL-4 blockade. And here on 21 patients that were uh, had also escaped many lines of disease, we observe one complete response, which is this one, which is still in response. After 357 days, you know, having uh, 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 started the first treatment, we just gave two doses of uh, three doses of Gupilumab of I4 receptor blockade because this was self-funded. This, this and we didn't have enough money to give more. <clears throat> now we are redesigning another study to to give the I4 uh, uh, blockade for a prolonged period of time. We also observed uh, two partial responses and five uh, stable disease. So we are now expanding the study to and to uh, increase the doses of IL-4 blockade and also start earlier uh, in the disease setting, you know, hopefully in the neoadjuvant setting, in the pre-surgical setting. Okay, so this was a do example of how you can really now study patients. I understand that this technology is not available everywhere. It's something that we can do only in, 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 in special places. But I just wanted to inspire you and show what it is, like it is possible. There is a technology now to study patients in a way that was never possible before. Now, when I present that, I often say, you know, also in different places in the US that it's possible to partner. It's possible to partner to study patients uh, uh, differently and better in many places of the world. And, uh, and the first thing to, that, that you could partner with you know, different places uh, across countries to build and enhance biobank. Here I'm talking about tumor biobank, but of course you can talk about primary immunodeficiency biobank. This is very important because when you own the tissue, you can be then transformative. And this is really the first step. How can you build an enhanced biobank? You can start developing atlases of Iranian inflammatory diseases or or, or tumor diseases or, or primary immunodeficiency disease. And you can start small, you can start by studying only one part, you know, so you can start with uh, looking at immune cell composition at using antibody staining, and then you can uh, 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 study more deeply looking at the DNA or RNA organization. And often we can also think about early clinical trials white t-shirt with uh, uh, the white t-shirt, I think, in celebration of um, uh, Cancer Day. Uh, and uh, and this is IO for uh, a word immune of cancer. All right. Uh, so with this, I will stop. And I thank you for the invitation to celebrate this important day with you today. Many thanks, Miriam. We will take uh, the, the question the, at the end. So now we can move on uh, with our second uh, uh, woman speaker, uh, Iranian and French, Beazine Combadier. So she's the um, global head of Novel Vaccine Early Stage Immunology at Vaccine uh, Research and Development. She obtained her PhD in immunology in 1993. 
in Sorbonne University in France on the regulation of HIV-specific CD8 response. She was a postdoctoral fellow from 1993 to 1997 in the Laboratory of Immunology with an expertise on T-cell immunity in NIH. She joined the French National Institute of Health and LSN in CERN from 1998 to 2022 as a head laboratory on skin immunity and vaccination. She was the co-director of the Center for Immunology and Microbial Infection and the co-director of international vaccinology courses of Institut Pasteur of Paris. Of Paris, sorry. She headed uh, the European project on HIV vaccination from 2010 to 2016, gathering 14 international institutes worldwide and leader in the European project H2020 for the development of candidate HIV vaccine from early stage to phase one clinical study. She has a large expertise in vaccinology and immune uh, memory to infectious disease. Uh, including uh, smallpox, HIV, influenza, SARS-CoV-2. She pioneers the skin immunization with the development of transcutaneous using hair follicle targeting method, which has been successful in several clinical studies. And she has received several awards, including the Woman in Science and Innovation of L de France in 2020 and Chevalier de l'Ordre National du Mérite in 2022. And we are very happy to have Beazin here as a member of the SFE. And, um, as a Iranian French uh, immunologist. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nushin. Thank you for this very nice introduction. I'm very pleased to be uh, with you today. And actually, when Nushin sent me a message that uh, proposing me to participate to women in science and particularly Iranian women in science, I was very honored. And I and I had only one thing is to accept, <laughs> although it's very difficult for me because the work I'm going to present is the work done at INSERM unit. And now I'm part of uh, Sanofi uh, as global head of early stage immunology. Uh, I have to say that my um, my love for vaccinology started when I was a child and when my mom took me to the Institut Pasteur of Iran for vaccination. And I was really um, amazed by this this institute and the, you know how people are going to be uh, vaccinated and actually help them to control disease infection. And I was wondering how would that work. And when I did my master's degree at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, it was a, a dream coming true. And I'm very happy actually I can share all the work I've done. And you can see that I was very much interested in needle-free vaccinations for that time on HIV vaccination, but also uh, now on really all the vaccine we can develop. And being at Sanofi today is helping me actually to, to be part of a, of a of an adventure of creating, uh, developing a new vaccine worldwide. Uh, and I'm happy to share uh, my experience in immunology with you. So um, I think I can change the slide this way. Um, so, you know, vaccination uh, until now has been very empirical. You know that, and it has been uh, always developed this way. And it works because uh, you know that people are protected. However, we have moved uh, now to uh, with more efficient vaccine, uh, mass production, less uh, side effect with using modern vaccination by doing genomic sequencing, reverse vaccinology, the routes of administration has changed uh, or proposed new one in adjuvantation. And now we are moving toward another step in vaccinology, which is, um, which is more, personalized, uh, having um, introducing system biology or system vaccinology, um, artificial intelligence, and considering individual consideration. So I'm going to talk about all that in my talk. And uh, now this personalized vaccination, we are already actually vaccinating people in a group. We are vaccinating adults, pregnant women, child, or um, um, people with disease, uh, a little bit differently with different consideration. And uh, it is important to, in, to consider in the future. You know, because the, the fact is the immune response is, is heterogeneous in the population. And why is it heterogeneous? Is we know today that two to 10 percent adult healthy don't increase their immune responses following vaccination. So we call them non-responders or low responders. And this proportion is increasing the population at risk. So elderly, chronic disease, immunosuppressed, we have more people uh, that are non-responders or low responders. And this is related to 
three factors the host genetic factors which is uh you know all the polymorphisms uh associated with hla for example or polymorphisms in gene involved in immune mechanisms so, such as uh, cxcr5 or cx uh, CL13, which is associated with T follicular helper cells, or polymorphisms in co simulatory molecules. Those genetic factors are uh, rare and uh, very heterogeneous, and we are not able to work with that when we are uh, dealing with mass vaccination. Uh, we have also all the uh, factor related to the host. So we call host-related factors, which is aging, chronic diseases, obesity, nutrition, and microbiota. And actually, uh, we published a work on microbiota um, showing that uh, the microbiota that are associated with the well-being of the individuals is associated with high responders uh, to vaccines. And then we have the, the third parameter, which is more something that we can work on and, and uh, try to refine it, which is the vaccination strategy. The vaccination strategy is the vaccine design. So the formulation, whether we are going to use protein versus uh, today mRNA vaccine or vector-based vaccine, the doses of vaccine. And I will give you the example of influenza high dose versus standard dose vaccination. We can also work on the root administration uh, to define the, you know, better immune responses. And we can also work on the vaccination strategy itself, which is the distance between prime and boost or the number of boosts that you have. And this, this can play a role in um, moving the borders uh, the boundaries in uh, vaccination and having more people responding better to vaccine developments, to vaccine response. So just a reminder, how does it work? And I, I know you're all immunologists and you are all about this, but I think it's good to, to actually have a, a, a certain, um, um, put it back on the table. We know today actually that um, that when um, a vaccine is introduced in, in the body, you have all the innate um, signals and innate information that are associated with the vaccine formulation. So including neutrophils, monocyte, dendritic cells, but also inflammatory cytokines that are actually playing hours and days of role. And I'm going to talk this innate signature at the beginning of the vaccination. We know that this innate signature actually is programming, and the word is programming uh, the adaptive immunity. And uh, with that, we know that the, the uh, initiation of immune responses is actually programming the effector phase, whether we are going to have high affinity functional antibodies, whether we are going to have antibody with large breadth, whether we are going to have mucosal immunity or T cells or tissue located immunity or even duration of immunity. We know that today we are dealing a lot with can, can we have immune responses persist after mRNA vaccination or can we uh, have better responses with adjuvantation? So those are questions that all the vaccinologists that are immunology are actually asking. And we um, we are also, uh, I don't know what it, we are also um, know that modulating the innate phase by changing the route of administration, the vaccine formulation will actually change the effector phase. And uh, this is also an important, and as vaccinology, we can play around with that on uh, for vaccine immune responses. So I start with the first, um, uh, sorry, I go back a little bit. So what, what was really difficult before I would say the mRNA era is that we were, I mean, all the vaccinologists were looking at how we can have better long-lived plasma cells, how we can have better CDH responses, and how we can have a very good T follicular helper cells that can actually uh, have those broadly neutralizing functional antibodies and uh, produced by B cells. Um, today it has been a little bit changed, but at the at the beginning of um, this era where we were looking at better CD8 responses, people were looking at root of administration and whether if they changed the targeting of different uh, dendritic cell type, we can modify the quality of the immune responses. And I was very much interested in, um, in uh, skin immunization and I uh, was asking the question whether the roots of immunization can actually drive cellular responses versus humoral responses. 
we know with all the vaccine, we mostly, oh God, we, we are losing some of the slides. Um, so we, we actually, we, um, okay, I guess. Uh, I start with skin because the skin is a is a very um, let me okay so um, we were I was questioning the role of dend skin dendritic cells and it was published uh, by um, Marshall's group that uh, high there are high concentration of various dendritic cells in the skin. The Langerian cells in the epidermis, they can migrate to the T cell zone. So for, for me, it was very interesting because if they can migrate to the T cell zone, it was maybe prompt, better prompt to induce T cell responses. And the dermal dendritic cells they are migrating to the B cell zone, so better prompt to induce B cell responses and humor responses. We also don't know. Sorry, I have to go back. Okay, so uh, there are different type of Langerian cells in the skin. So you have the Langerian cells that are in the epidermis and you have the dermal dendritic cells that are in the dermis and the dermal macrophages. Uh, that are in the deep dermis, so uh, or hypodermis. Uh, it it is very important that behind, I put only three type of cells, but there is five different type of uh, dendritic cells in the skin, and you have all that. But what we showed in the, in the past is that the targeting of longer cells would um, probably induce CD8 responses, and the targeting of dermal dendritic cells would induce CD4 responses. And we needed to uh, target the longer and cells in the skin and only the longer and cells in the screen. So in uh, early 2000, I developed with a collaboration with the charity hospital, with the dermatologist, a way to actually target longer and cells. And that was to open the hair duct because all around the hair duct, there was longer and cells lying there. And the der der in the dermis is the der dermal dendritic cells. And what we did, we actually opened it with by tape stripping, and we were we showed that actually we can um, let the uh, vaccine compounds penetrate to the hair duct, uh, and we need to we did need to know what is the size of the vaccine compound that can penetrate, and we showed that something between two thousand nanometers to forty nanometers can penetrate deep in the hair duct and be uptaken by longer cells. Uh, here, you can show that longer cells can uptake the vaccine compounds. And we developed a method that was we were able to use it in human clinical study. And that was the first time we were only showing that the targeting of longer cells using hair um, tape stripping and targeting of longer cells. And this is uh, the size 2000 nanometers to 40 is a suitable size for uptake of vaccine that are nanoparticles, virus like particles, small viruses, DNA, and even mRNA today. And we showed actually when you target the longer cells, so by transcutaneous immunization, you only have CD8 responses. And this is all the publication we did at that time. And if you have intradermal immunization, you have actually uh, the CD4 cells, CD8 cells, but you have also much more pain. And the intramuscular immunization is inducing only CD4 and CD uh, antibody responses. And this is based on the protein-based vaccines. And that was very interesting because uh, as an immunologic point of view, it means that targeting different type of lung and cells, you can actually induce different quality of immune responses. So CD8 versus Humor and CD8 responses. Um, so we decided to actually question the fact that uh, if we use three modes of administration, so intradermal targeting dermis, intramuscular, which is the conventional way of vaccination, and the transcutaneous, which is only targeting longer cells, whether that would affect immune responses after vaccination. 
So this work has been also published, but I show you how we, we did this work. So we did early analysis of gene expression at the zero and plus one day, and we did also late analysis of immune responses, humoral versus steroid responses. So what we showed, um, and I don't know why I don't have my slides. Um, okay, the summary is on the table here. We showed that the transcutaneous is inducing CD8 response. The intradermal is inducing both antibody and CD8 response. The intramuscular is only inducing antibody responses against influenza. So meaning three routes of immunization is inducing different type of immune responses. And I hope I'm gonna have the rest. Okay. So um, then we question the innate immunity. And that was the, the, the most interesting part because we thought because we have three routes of immunization, we will have three innate profile of the individuals. And what we find is only two major profile, independent of the routes of, of immunization. So you can see that the individual are distributed in two clusters. So the first cluster here and the second cluster here. And when you look at those clusters, the difference between those two clusters is the interference signaling pathway. It means that um, by doing inter by just difference in interferon signaling pathway, we have two group of individuals that are distributed. And when we look at the immune responses, so um, weeks later in those individuals, we found actually that those individuals they have either antibody responses or cellular responses which means that the heterogeneity of individuals, so the innate heterogeneity of immune responses at the individual level is even more important than the root of in administration. And I don't have the slides of the results, so I'm switching to the, to the second part of my talk. Sorry about that. So the, the, so the first part of, was about the root of administration, and we showed actually that of course, targeting different type of dendritic cells can modify the quality of immune responses, but the innate responses at the beginning, so early innate responses, and actually um, 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 programming or or showing different type of immune responses by in by for each individual. So we switch to the second part, which was okay. Now, if we change the dose of the vaccine, what would that change? So I had the chance to collaborate uh, with Sanofi on, on using the high-dose influenza vaccine versus the standard-dose influenza vaccine. So the high-dose influenza vaccine has four times more HA uh, protein than the standard-dose influenza vaccine. And it is used in European countries, but also mostly in the U.S., in the elderly individuals more than 65 years old. Um, so we know that the quadrivalent high dose influenza has been shown to be have better protection than the standard dose and with a relative efficacy of plus 24 percent and it has been shown over different seasons. Uh, we, the, it has been also shown that the HA titers high dose is more important than the standard dose. So we know that the high dose is inducing more antibody than the standard dose. And uh, it has been shown also that we can protect beyond flu uh, from pneumonia infection for cardiorespiratory uh, disease and all causes 8% uh, diminution. So, but the question was that if we have a high dose, why we have high dose uh, HA titer with, um, with high dose influenza? So we questioned what is the mechanism in, in elderly? We did a randomized clinical study uh, comparing uh, a group of individuals receiving high dose, those are aged individuals over 65, to a group of individuals receiving standard dose. And uh, we compared the innate immunity at early time points, so day zero and day plus one, to, and adaptive immunity. What we showed here is that the early, um, the adaptive immunity, the HA titers is higher in the high dose individuals. And we question whether what would be the innate immunity at the early uh, time points. 
we found that actually uh, when you do, um, I hope that I have the images. I don't have the images. I'm sorry about that. Uh, let me see if I have the next one. OK. Um, so we showed actually if you compare the gene expression, so the red genes are upregulated, the, the uh, blue genes are downregulated. Uh, so you compare the standard dose to the high dose. So the signature, it's much higher for the high dose. So this is one day post immunization. So gene expression are much higher in the high dose compared to the standard dose. But it stems in a diagonal, meaning that they are inducing probably the same genes upregulated, but it's a higher expression and a higher uh, p-value or significancy in, uh, in, uh, when they are vaccinated with high-dose influenza compared to the standard-dose influenza. And if you look at those genes, those genes are involved in interferon pathways, in neutrophils activation, host defenses, antigen processing, and cell cycle metabolisms. Those are all the good genes that are involved post-vaccination that are associated with better immune responses after vaccination. But we have those genes, remember, we are in elderly individuals. And meaning that in elderly individuals, you need to boost a little bit the immune system to have better immune responses. So we question whether uh, we can compare those gene expression um, between elderly and young um, young individuals. And we actually compared our data to the public data available in uh, young adults vaccinated with the uh, standard dose influenza. We integrated those data and we, um, we find, uh, we looked at the genes that are involved in high dose response, in standard dose response, and the young adults vaccinated with trivalent influenza vaccine. So what we found is indeed, uh, if you look at the modules that are associated with those pathway, we have much higher expression. You can see uh, red with the high dose compared to the standard dose. And we, when we compare that to young adults, the genes are similar in young adults then with the high uh, vaccinated with the standard dose compared to the elderly vaccinated with the high dose. So we call that regeneration of the gene expression. It means that by, by boosting a better, uh, using high dose, uh, boosting the immune responses, innate immune responses in elderly, we can obtain a gene signature that is similar to the young adults. And I think this is very interesting. It means that if in vaccination you're working on the standard dose of vaccine, you might think again your formulation and your vaccination when you just move to a particular population, meaning the uh, elderly here, or it could be people with other diseases and uh, that have deficiency in pathways. So um, I'm done with that because uh, I think we need uh, time for discussions. And uh, just to thank everyone that has participated to the clinical study. And I apologize for this slide that moved from the version I have on my computer and the version that it's uploaded. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Behazin, for this great talk. Uh, I think we have a time for a few questions. If there are any, the audience can raise hand. And of course, we have more time for discussion at the end of our webinar. Uh, there are questions in chat. Um, okay, do you see? Yeah, the, the, one of the questions I can read, I don't have it in the right order maybe, but there's one question for, for Miriam, I think. And one question for me. Do you want me to start or maybe a question for Miriam? Uh, do you, can you read it? I yes, cannot. so there's a question for Miriam. So okay. do you believe we can cure cancer only based on immune system potential, Miriam? Maybe. Okay, should... maybe I can do mine. So yeah. using high dose vaccine does not lead to side effects. So 
actually it has it, they sh it we show that it has similar side effect in elderly using high dose uh, compared to standard dose so there is no significant changes in the side effect and it's published okay thank you very much so maybe we can go further for the next speaker yeah our next our next Next speaker is Monir Torabi. She's a PhD student in Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Monir has done a great effort to summarize the history of immunology and pioneering women immunologists in Iran. Uh, you can start, Monir, please. Thank you, dear Mehrat. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great honor and privilege for me to be here to share with you uh, the fascinating journey of immunology in Iran with a special focus on the invaluable contributions made by women. In the next minutes, we'll explore the milestones and influential figures that shaped the history of immunology uh, in this remarkable country. So, uh, our journey begins in the ninth century with the two prominent figures in Iran called Rajas and Avicenna who made significant contribution, contributions to Iranian medicine and pointed out the body's immune uh, function. Razas, or as we call it in Persian, uh, Muhammad ibn Zakaria Razi, was one of the earliest physicians that described the clinical manifestations of allergic rhinitis or hay fever, approximately 900 years earlier than John Bostick, and advised prophylactic treatments to manage allergic symptoms. Razi also uh, was the first, uh, wrote the first known article on allergy and immunology. The other figure is Avicenna, who is also recognized as the father of modern medicine. Uh, he was a physician and also a polymath and highlighted the role of immune system in protecting the body from external pathogens. In his famous uh, Encyclopedia of Medicine, called The Canon of Medicine, or as we call in Persian, Qanun, he discussed the concept of immunity and proposed the theory of acquired immunity. Fast forward to the 19th century, uh, the first evidence of, uh, we see the first evidence of inoculation in Iran. There are several evidences that show nomads in the southeast of Iran, namely Baluchistan, enforced their children uh, to milking the sick cows and in this way they believe that this action immunizes them against uh, human smallpox. Later in the 19th century a turning point happened in the history of immunology in Iran during the Qajar dynasty uh, and during the outbreak of smallpox in Iran. At that time smallpox was widespread throughout the country uh, and vaccination against smallpox initiated at a small scale by a British physician called Dr. John Carmack. However, his action was opposed severely by the public and most people refused to accept vaccination. In such a situation, an Iranian reformist prime minister, an influential figure named Amir Kabir, made a historical decision and made the public smallpox vaccination mandatory by his order. And this was the official initiation of mass vaccination in Iran's history. The 19th, the 19th century was also marked by another influential figure called Dr. Mohammad Kerman Shahi, who was a graduate from Darul Funun School, and he was a medicine uh, physician also. Uh, he was the first one who wrote the first serology book, book in Iran and also described the concepts of uh, serology in Iran for the first time. He also was the first one who uh, brought the medical microscope to Iran using it to demonstrate blood cells to the medical students. Uh, in, the next, in the 20th century, Iran witnessed the formalization in, of immunology as a scientific discipline, and several academic institutions were established in Iran. One of them was the Pasteur Institute of Iran, founded in 1920 
which was established with the primary mission of producing vaccines against infection diseases. The Institute became a regional leader for the development of vaccines against prevalent diseases and contributed significantly to preventing and controlling the infectious diseases, not only in Iran, but also in the whole region. Simultaneously, in 1924, the Razi Vaccine and Serum uh, Institute were established and became a key vaccine production and research center with a prominent commitment to addressing challenges faced by Iran's agricultural, agricultural and livestock industry. At the time, cattle plug extensively struck Iran under and under the supervision of Dr. Joseph Delphi, a British veterinary, um, sorry, a French veterinarian, the Institute, the Razi Institute, uh, successfully accomplished developing a vaccine against cattle plug. The period also saw the emergence of Dr. Hossein Mushamsi, a significant figure in Iran's vaccine field. He served at Razi Vaccine and Serum Research Institute uh, over the five decades and he's called the father, of, the father of vaccinology in Iran. He founded the Department of Vaccine Development for Diphtheria, Tetanus, and Pertosis at Razi Institute, and served as an advisor to the WHO on vaccine manufacturing in various countries other than Iran. Uh, one significant milestone in the history of immunology uh, in the 20th century was the establishment of the, of the first department of serology at Tehran University of uh, Medical Sciences uh, by the pioneering efforts of Dr. Hassan Mir Damadi. Dr. Mir Damadi is recognized as the father of serology in Iran uh, and was a microbiologist and immunologist who appointed as assistant professor at Tehran University at that time. And in 1951, he founded the first department of serology in Iran, which also encompassed microbiology and parasitology too. So uh, later, Dr. Kolom Reza Nazari later separated the immunology department, shaping the history of contemporary immunology. Uh, later, parallel with these advancements in Tehran University, other universities and research institutes launched, launched their immunology department, and several immunologists emerged all over the country. Uh, one of them was Dr. Hassan Taj Bakhsh, who greatly influenced the field of veterinary immunology. So, uh, progress of modern immunology in Iran has also been shaped by the work of famous Iranian women that their history that their story has remained untold so far. Our journey toward the history of uh, Iranian immunology is illuminated by the contribution of uh, famous Iranian women uh, and here are some of the pioneering women who have significantly impacted the field. Our journey uh, sorry. Our journey begins with Dr. Behjato Sadat Mayedi, who was a pioneer in immunohematology, who is also a pioneer uh, in immunohematology. She began her impactful journey with a doctorate in pharmaceutical science in 1968 from Tehran University, and she started her academic career, career as a lecturer in Isfahan University in 1968. However, uh, later, she left the country for her postgraduate study at Virginia Medical College in the U.S., earning a specialties in blood banking technology and a PhD in immunology. After returning to Iran again, she appointed as assistant professor at Isfahan University of Medical Sciences uh, from 1978 until her, her retirement as a full professor in 2011. She now holds the title of Distinguished Professor of Immunology and her main research appeared to focus on immunohematology uh, and uh, the uh, therapeutic effects of a compound known, known Silimari. With a robust pub publication record, she authored five books and several 
articles in international journals. Another figure, Dr. Shahnaz Rafi Tehrani, is also a pioneer in immunology in Iran. She was the first Iranian woman who obtained professorship in immunology. Uh, she received her MD degree from Tehran University of Medical Sciences and also her PhD and doctorate of medical, medical technologies from the same institute. Then she started her academic career in 1972 as an assistant professor at Tehran University of Medical Sciences and rose her medical rank to full professorship in 1993. Uh, her, her major researches mainly focused on autoimmune diseases and immune tolerance, and her research led to the publication of several books in Persian and English for medical students, and also publication of several scientific articles in international journals. She was also the editor-in-chief of Journal of Allergy and Asthma and Immunology uh, for more than a decade. Another pioneer was Dr. Mahru Mirahmadiyan, uh, which is another distinguished figure in the field of immunology in Iran. Her academic journey commenced at Tehran University, where she earned both her doctorate in medicine uh, and also a doctorate in medical technology and PhD in immunology. Following a postdoc in the University of London, she became an assistant professor in immunology in 1972 and later uh, rose to full professorship of immunology at the same institute. Uh, she's widely recognized among students primarily for her, her exceptional translation work of cellular and molecular immunology book by Professor Abul Abbas. Uh, and uh, her major research focused on immune, autoimmune diseases and multiple myeloma. She has also received several prestigious awards in Iran, and one of the important of them were, uh, were Iranian Book of the Year and also the International uh, Professor Yalda Award in 2013. Another figure is Dr. Mino Adim, a distinguished immunologist who uh, earned her Doctor of Medicine in 1975 and a PhD in medical immunology from University of Kent at uh, Cat, uh, Canterbury, England. After several fellowships in Germany, she became to Iran and became an, uh, she returned to Iran and became an assistant professor in 1984. And uh, she was, she retired as a full professor in 2013. Her major research focused on organ transplantation and anti-HLA antibodies and immunogenetics, which the results of her research led to the publication of three books in immunology and more than 50 published papers in international journals. She was the founder of first organ transplantation laboratory in immunology and as a head of the organ transplantation laboratory she saved lives of several patients by finding compatible transplant organs. Uh, Dr. Rubabe Rezaipur is another distinguished immunologist with a background in biology. She obtained her PhD from Illinois University in the US and then returned to the country and served as an assistant professor at Shade Beach University of Medical Sciences since 1984 and retired as full professor in 2015. Her pioneering research includes studying immunogenicity of mustard gas with the aim of helping veterans and developing contraceptive vaccines. Dr. Reza Ipur has authored and translated five immunology books and published several papers uh, in immunology in international journals. Another person, Dr. Nariman Mosafa, is a pioneering scientist in the field of infectious diseases uh, and find her academic roots in the veterinary medicine. Uh, she earned her PhD in medical immunology in 1986 
And uh, since then, she served as an assistant professor of immunology at Shade Beishti University of Medical Sciences and rose her medical her, uh, academic rank to full professorship of immunology in 2004. Uh, her major research focused uh, on immunology of infectious diseases and her influential research has breached the gap between basic and clinical science, transforming the perspective of physicians about hospital infections. Moreover, with her background in veterinary medicine, she's an, an expert in laboratory animal for uh, immunological projects. Dr. Mosafo has authored 16 books in, in English and Persian and published more than 200 papers in international journals. She also received numerous awards, including the Best Book Award from the Ministry of Health in 2004 and an Exemplary Professor Award in 2017. It is noteworthy that Dr. Mosafa is not only a professor, but her advocacy to holistic education makes her an outstanding mentor among all Iranian immunologists. And Dr. Masume Eptekar is an academic luminary and the first woman who had a position in the cabinet of Iran after the Islamic Revolution. With a background in medical technology, uh, she got her master's and PhD in medical immunology from Tarbiyat Modaris University and become a faculty member at the same institute since 1989. And currently she's an associate professor Tarbiat Modaris University. Her major research was in immunoregulation, psychoneuroimmunology, and the effects of pollutants on immune system function, which led to four, uh, eight books in Persian and English and several publications in international journals. And notably, she served as an Iran's first woman vice president and the head of the Department of Environment from 1997 to 2005. And she, uh, she has received several pres prestigious awards internationally. And the most important one was the uh, champion of the Earth Award in 2006 from the United Nations. Dr. Kobay Tezami is an esteemed immunologist with impressive academic journey. Graduating in laboratory medicine in 1977, she pursued her master's and PhD in immunology at the University of London and earned her PhD in 1991. Uh, then returning to country, she became an assistant professor uh, at Iran University of Medical Sciences and retired as associate professor in 2017. Dr. Entezami has conducted significant research on immune phenotyping of immune cells, and also she has searched a research on immune response to burn injuries, resulting in authoring nine books and publishing several papers in international journals. And Dr. Tahereh Musavi is also an esteemed immunologist with a background in pharmaceutical science. She earned her PhD uh, from Tehran University of Medical Sciences in 1989 in the medical immunology. Then uh, immediately she became an assistant professor of immunology at Zanjan University and later in Qazmin University. The two inst in the two institutions, uh, she founded the immunology department. Then she rose her academic rank from uh, assistant professor to associate professor and full professorship. And now she's retired uh, from Iran University of Medical Sciences. Her research mainly focused on immunology of immune, uh, microbial infections and development of vaccines against various microbial agents. And uh, the results of her research led to authoring and translating six immunology books and several uh, articles in international journals. Dr. Zahra Amir Gofran is also a distinguished professor in medical immunology at Shiraz University of Medical Sciences. 
with her background in laboratory science, she obtained her PhD in medical immunology from Tarbiat Modares University. And uh, immediately she became assistant professor of immunology in immunology uh, in Shiraz University of Medical Sciences. Then after several fellowships in Switzerland, she rose her medical rank to full professorship and currently she's known as a distinguished professor of immunology at Shiraz University of Medical Sciences. Her research mainly focuses on immunopharmacology and immunomodulatory effects of medicinal products. And interestingly, she was the first person in Iran who accomplished production of monoclonal antibodies in Iran in 1993. And the results of her research uh, led to the publication of more than 170 papers in international journals and one textbook. She also received several honors and awards, especially in 1993, she received the prestigious Kharazmi Award. Dr. Mandela Satori is another distinguished figure in immunology, has an interesting academic journey. She earned her in, uh, dentistry degree in 1990, and later she achieved a PhD in immunology in 1994. And joining Shahid Beishtin University of Medical Sciences, she progressed from assistant professorship to full professorship. Uh, Dr. Mandana Sattari's research is mainly focused on oral immunology and immunopathology, and immunopathology of the oral cavity. And also, uh, the important work is done by her is advancing oral immunology in Iran for the first time. Her research led to the publication of several papers in international journals and altering and translating four immunology books uh, in Iran. And she has also received several awards, the most important of which were, were the Distinguished Lecturer Award from Shahid Beshti University of Medical Sciences. Uh, Dr. Zahra Purbak is a prominent figure in the field of clinical immunology in Iran. With a background in medicine, she earned her PhD in 1995 from Tehran University and became an assistant professor in 1996 at the same institute. And she rose her academic degree to full professorship in uh, Immunology Osman Allergy Research Center at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Her research mainly focused on immunology of asthma and allergy and also immunodeficiencies. And she published more than 250 research articles regarding the uh, um, allergies and immunodeficiencies. She's also uh, um, recognized as a distinguished researcher in 2008. And currently, he's the, she's the head of Asthma and Allergy Research Center at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. And Dr. Simara Fatih is a renowned scientist with a background in, in, in immunology and microbiology from the University of Washington. She earned her master's and PhD uh, in Tehran University of Medical Sciences and Pasteur Institute of, Institute of Iran, respectively. And she has become an assistant professor at Pasteur Institute of Iran since 1996 and led to full professorship uh, in the same institute. She has also passed several post postdocs uh, in foreign countries, especially Switzerland. Dr. Rafati's major research includes the immune response to Lishmania major DNA vaccines, and she has also contributed over the years to the immunology of human Lishmaniasis. She has published over 150 papers in international journals and submitted nine, nine genes regard, uh, related to Lishmania species to gene bank. Uh, one of the major contributions to the field that was uh, done by Dr. Rafati was the establishment of molecular immunology uh, laboratory with a grant from WHO and development of vaccines against Lishmaniasis in a canine model. 
She has uh, published more than 150 papers and two book chapters in immunology. She has also uh, received several prestigious awards. The most important one was the Pasteur UNESCO Gold Medal in 2001 and the Best Woman Elites uh, Award in 2007. Another important figure in uh, Iranian immunology is Dr. Tuba Ghazanfari, a distinguished immunologist at Shahed University of Medical Sciences. With a background in animal biology from Tehran University, she obtained her uh, master's and PhD from Tehran University of Medical Sciences in medical immunology. And she appointed as associate professor of immunology at Shahed University since 1999. And currently she's the full professor of immunology at the same institute. Uh, she received numerous awards also, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the major researches of Dr. Ghazan Fari is focused on the effects of master gas on immune system. And she has worked more than 10 years uh, on the victims of chemical bombardment in Sardash region of Iran. She has also worked on immune regulation and immune modulation and inflammation uh, and effects of different uh, immune modulatory agents. She has more than 150 papers published in international journals and five textbooks in, in immunology, in addition to five patents in immunotherapeutic agents. She has received several awards and honors uh, as a result of her research. The most important one uh, was distinguished researcher in the 22nd Festival of the Selected Researchers. And she has also been selected as a distinguished professor by the Iranian Ministry of Health. She founded the Department of Immunology in Shahid University and also founded the, immu the Immunoregulation Research Center in the same institute and currently is the editor-in-chief of Immunoregulation Journal. So, as you may have noticed so far, women immunologists in Iran come from diverse academic background, from medicine to pharmaceutical sciences, biology, dentistry, medical technology, and even veterinary medicine. The diversity of academic backgrounds uh, among Iranian immunologists uh, re reflects the multifaceted nature of immunology in Iran which makes a unique opportunity for young generation. Moreover, these women represent a fraction of accomplished immunologists in Iran. And there are other talented and dedicated individuals on the track, the current generation of young immunologists uh, are making substantial strides, bringing fresh perspective and innovative, immunolo innovative ideas to the field of immunology. And the results of their efforts will come into the light in the coming years. Thank you for your attention. I'm here for any question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Monir, for this nice presentation. Uh, I hope you are not tired and enjoying uh, the webinar. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Nafise Ismail, as I explained earlier. Uh, she is an associate professor of immunology in Esfahan Medical University, and she's also the head of the department. Uh, and also, Nafise will be uh, Scientific Secretary of the next Iranian Congress of Immunology. Uh, Nafise, please. Nafise, are you ready to start? Yes. Okay, please. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. 
I'm Mattis Ismail, a PhD of Immunology and a Head of Immunology Department of Swan University of Medical Sciences. Uh, at the first, uh, I would like uh, to thank the organizing committee of this uh, webinar uh, for uh, inviting me to share my research journey with all of you. And uh, as you see, uh, the topic of my presentation is NK and current case therapy in cell tumor. Uh, Uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, NK cells uh, are the unique uh, population of immune cells uh, that um, are very important uh, immune cells against uh, virus infections and also in uh, cancer. Uh, and uh, we have uh, only uh, two main population of NK cells in peripheral blood, including CD50-60 main cases and CD56 bright NK cells. And the most population in the peripheral blood are CD50-60 main cases. Uh, these uh, cells usually have a strong natural cytotoxicity against cancer cells, uh, and they can produce peperin and granzyme. And uh, also, uh, they have a strong uh, antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity uh, function, and uh, but they produce a low levels of cytokines. Cluster cell, we have the other uh, population uh, as C bright, uh, CD56 bright in cases that they produce strongly cytokines, including interferon gamma, TNF alpha, and IL10. And uh, they have a weak uh, natural cytotoxicity and uh, ABCC function. As you know, the balance between uh, two types of receptors of in cases are very important uh, in the uh, immune system. We have uh, two types of receptors on the surface of NK cells, activating receptors and inhibitory receptors. And uh, as you know, the interaction between inhibitory receptors and NFC class 1 molecules uh, in a healthy condition uh, usually suffers NK cells and we don't have activation of these cells. But uh, interaction between activating receptor uh, and the ligands uh, on the surface of target cells usually active uh, NK cells and uh, we have a strong cytotoxicity against uh, tumor cells or virus infected cells. Uh, we need uh, maybe huge uh, population of NK cells for NK therapy, and we have different sources for uh, production of NK cells, including peripheral blood, uh, cord blood, IPS, uh, IPS uh, cells, and uh, cell lines like N uh, NK92. And uh, also, we need to expand these cells uh, in vitro uh, or maybe ex vivo by uh, some uh, types of cytokines, including IL2, IL15, IL18. Uh, and IL-21, and uh, also these cells are very sensitive and we need uh, more maybe growth factor, factors for uh, expansion of these cells, uh, like uh, adding filler cells to produce a large number of NK cells. We can use these types of NK cells uh, directly for uh, cancer treatment as NK therapy, and also we can manipulate uh, these NK cells and uh, produce uh, maybe uh, some types of cells like uh, car NK cells, and uh, we can use these types of cells uh, also for cancer immunotherapy. And also, we can activate NK cells uh, in vivo by uh, administration in some types of cytokines, including IL2, IL15, IL12, uh, and IL21. Uh, and um, studies have shown also uh, blocking of some uh, immune checkpoints or uh, some inhibitory receptors on the surface of NK cells restore the function of NK cells and activate these cells. Uh, in this uh, slide, you can see some uh, of my uh, publication related to NK cells. I started uh, my work on NK cells uh, six years ago when I tried to expand NK cells uh, in vitro by using different uh, cocktail uh, of cytokine, uh, cytokines and also different feeder cells. And, at the same time, I uh, was uh, wondering and I uh, was thinking about uh, a unique population of NK cells that are present in the uterus uh, during pregnancy. And the role of these types of NK cells are really important for maintenance of tolerance during pregnancy. And uh, I uh, focused uh, on the uh, research for uh, determination of the uh, interaction between these types of NK cells. And, uh, human amniotic epithelial cells. 
uh, and uh, then uh, I was thinking about uh, NK therapy and uh, as you know, uh, NK therapy in hematologic uh, malignancies uh, maybe have shown some uh, promising results and uh, we uh, at, the, at this time used NK therapy in different uh, hematologic malignancies and recently also NK therapy uh, for uh, human uh, transplantation, especially in uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, we used before hematopoietic stem cell transp uh, transplantation or after uh, the hematopoietic transplantation. But about some tumor, we have some obstacles or some uh, problems. Uh, at this time, uh, maybe nearly 40 clinical trials are uh, open to investigate the safety and efficiency of adaptive uh, infused NK cells uh, and most of them are uh, in combination with, uh, with other therapeutic modalities uh, and uh, all of uh, these uh, trials try to find a, a way to uh, overcome these obstacles or uh, problems in solid tumors. I can see the Q&A and we have now two questions uh, that I will ask. Uh, I'm in the Q&A part of the webinar. I think Nafis is coming, maybe we can ask one. Behazin, I, uh, can you answer a question if I ask? Are you prepared? Yes, yes yeah. I put it in the chat, but I can yeah. also. Uh, it is written, thank you for all these inspiring talks to Miriam and Behazin in the in this era of massive cellular and molecular atlases and systems immunology approaches, what would you recommend to fill the gap in terms of education, training of immunologists to interdisciplinary sk skills, including maths and programming? Yes, I think it's an excellent question. And you can see with from Miriam talks and my talk that we need more and more multidisciplinarity. So um, I mean, what, what is expected now today, even in different programs worldwide, you can see it also in UK, uh, you have to be trained in different disciplines in regard of the uh, direction you want to go. For example, in neuroscience, we know that neuroscience is closely related to immunology now. So we have immunology plus neuroscience or biology or math and modelization and infectious diseases. So I think that introducing those um, topic and program early in the education of those biology fields would be very important for the future directions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Miriam, uh, there is a question. Uh, so do you believe we can cure cancer only based on immune system potential? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think there is now very clear data that that targeting the immune system can transform outcome. Uh, 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 so, so now transforming outcome can mean, you know, tumor shrinkage, but the question is, can we really cure that cancer lesion? And I think the belief is that we will need combination treatment where we can eventually help uh, uh, target both the cancer cells and, and immune cells. We are still in, in, in the beginning of you know, this immunotherapy revolution. Right now, we have really, we are targeting only two pathways. You know, the drugs are really targeting only two pathways. We need to tackle the immune system through different roads so to know whether by only targeting immune cells, you know, we can really at least transform cancer into let's say a chronic lesions or or completely uh, block you know the possibility of metastasis to be react reactivated so difficult to answer these questions but whether the immunotherapy is going to be part of all cancer treatment i think this is now accepted by anyone in the field okay thank you very much i think uh, we will wait a few more minutes for Nafisa. She's trying, but if she cannot join, we will continue. Uh, as I said, I try to uh, target PDL1 molecules in, uh, for uh, cancer immunotherapy by CAR NK cells. So uh, uh, we try to design uh, CAR construct and we use an uh, anti PDL1 SCFB from atezolizumab and we labeled. Uh, 
these uh, molecules with my tag and also we use CD8 alpha hinge domain, CD28 uh, transmembrane domain and intracellular co-stimulatory domains uh, 41BB and uh, 2B4 and also activating domain from CD3 zeta uh, and you can see in this picture the structure of our uh, car construct. Please next uh, slide. And in this picture, you uh, can see uh, different vectors that we use for production of uh, car in cases, uh, PCDHTMB for uh, car construct, and also uh, packaging plasmid and envelope plasmid uh, that we use for production of lentiviral vectors. Uh, and uh, maybe the most uh, challenging uh, parts of our research, uh, it was that we uh, tried to produce uh, NK cells from uh, stem cells uh, that isolated from uh, cord blood, uh, and uh, we received cord blood units from uh, Ruyan Institute uh, of Spahan, and uh, then we uh, isolated CD34 positive uh, stem cells, and then we try to differentiate these SM cells uh, to the NK cells, and we try different uh, protocols. And uh, finally, we uh, design a protocol uh, with two steps. In the first step, uh, we uh, two weeks expanded uh, CD34 uh, positive SM cells uh, uh, by using uh, different uh, cytokines and growth factors, including TPO, IL6, FLT. TTRL and IL7, uh, STF and IGF-1. And then after two uh, weeks, we uh, followed the uh, differentiation of these stem cells to NK cells by using IL2, IL15, and FL3, FLT3L. And uh, as you can see, we had different uh, percentage of NK cells after differentiation. And uh, if the percentage of uh, NK cells uh, was low, we follow uh, the expansion of NK cells uh, for more weeks, maybe two, uh, three or four weeks. And uh, then uh, we decided to uh, assess the function of these NK cells uh, that are produced by uh, CD34 positive stem cells. Uh, and we compared uh, the function with peripheral blood NK cells, and we found that uh, stem cells derived NK cells uh, are more cytotoxic than uh, peripheral uh, natural killer cells. And the expression of uh, activating receptors uh, was higher in uh, uh, stem cell drives and cases. Uh, after uh production of N cases, uh, we uh, started uh, our uh, car NK cells uh, project. Uh, first, we should produce uh, lentiviral, uh, lentivirus. So we used uh, HEC 293 T cells for packaging of uh, plasmid, uh, plasmids. And uh, then we produced uh, lentivirus. And uh, then uh, we concentrated and uh, determined the MOI of, you know, of virus. And, uh, then we freeze the virus for transduction of NK cells. We decided uh, to uh, we decided to uh, follow two paths for production of car NK cells. In uh, first uh, protocol, we transfected uh, CD34 positive stem cells with lentivirus, and then we differentiated. Uh, these stem cells to the NK cells. And in the second one, uh, we differentiated CD34 uh, positive stem cells to NK cells, and then we transfected uh, these NK cells with uh, lentivirus. And we named these uh, two types of population as CAR -mod modified CD34 uh, four positive NK cells and CAR modified NK cells. In this picture, you can see the uh, confirmation of our vector and also our uh, construct and the results of uh, HEC uh, cells uh, transfection and uh, transduction of NK cells after selection uh, by uh, promising selection. And uh, also, you can see the expression of uh, car receptors on the surface of NK cells. According uh, to our results, uh, 
transduction of stem cells uh, was more efficient and we had a, a maybe more yields of uh, NK cells after transduction and um, about uh, differentiated uh, NK cells uh, from uh, CD34 positive cells, we had uh, le um, maybe less uh, transduction efficiency uh, than uh, the first one. Uh, after uh, production of current cases, we should uh, assess the function of these cells against cancer cells. So uh, we try to uh, co-culture uh, these current cases with their target cells, and we use the different uh, target cells. Uh, one of them were, uh, one, uh, was uh, MCF7, uh, as it says that uh, express low levels of uh, PDL1, and also we use MDA, MD. 231 as a cell line that express high levels of uh, PDL1 molecules. And also, uh, we try to uh, the function of these current cases against um, uh, ex hosted uh, T cells. So, uh, we uh, co cultured the PBMCs with concanabulin A and stimulate these cells for six days. And after six days, the expression of PD1 and T3 as uh, ex uh, markers uh, was increased on the surface of T cells. So, we used these uh, cells as, a, uh, uh, as an ex hosted T cells for uh, our next experiments. Uh, after co-culture of uh, current cases with target cells, uh, we measured the expression of CD107A uh, and also we measured the levels of interferon gamma and uh, we also assessed the apoptosis uh, of the uh, target cells. In this picture, uh, you can see the results uh, of CD107A, uh, and we found that uh, significant increase of this uh, marker as a, as a cytotoxic marker expression on the NK cells against MDA, MD231 uh, cells, and also the expression of CD107A was increased uh, in exhausted T cells after co culture with CAR NK cells. And also the level of uh, interferon gamma uh, was increased uh, against MDA, MB231, and we didn't find significant increase against MCF7. And uh, also uh, we found a significant increase of necrosis against MDA, MB231, and also against MCF7 cells uh, after treatment with PDL1. Uh, as a uh, conclusion, uh, according to our finding, the cytotoxic uh, function of both current cases was uh, almost the same against the uh, MDA uh, cells, and uh, but uh, according to our experience. Uh, the uh, transduction of stem cells was more efficient, and um, the possibility of producing CAR in case cells uh, with these cells is um, the um, finding of our uh, research. And, and we think uh, this uh, approach uh, will be with higher yield of uh, NK cells, so we can recommend this approach for uh, production of NK cells and for manipulation of NK cells. And also, uh, our finding remind us again the combination therapy of PDL1 CAR NK cells with other uh, CAR T cell or CAR NK cells uh, may be, uh, be more uh, effective, uh, and we can use uh, this type of treatment against uh, exhaustion uh, phenomenon that is uh, usually happen in uh, cancer uh, in, in tumor microenvironment. Uh, thank you for your attention. Please, the next slide. Uh, this is uh, my team uh, in this uh, project. Uh, I would be uh, thank. Uh, I would like to thank my uh, dear colleague, Dr. Uh, Akbari, 
for uh, her uh, help and uh, dedication. And also, I would like to thank my dear PhD student, Farouk Qaida Rahmati, uh, for uh, uh, hard work and also for her uh, dedication. And uh, at the end, as the scientific uh, secretary uh, of the 17th international congress of immunology i invite you uh, to our congress uh, will be held during uh, april 29 until may 2 2025 at isfahan uh, iran and and uh, this uh, International Congress of Immunology and Allergy is committed to promotion the cutting edge uh, progress in, in progress in the field of immunology. This magnificent, uh, magnificent uh, event has gained a broad public support for more than three decades and has the additional goal of uh, catalyzing uh, multilateral international partnership in immunology, spreading and increasing the understanding of modern immunological sciences among the immunologists. The Congress will be bringing together more than 500 uh, pa participants uh, from different research fields in immunology. Uh, and uh, please, next slide. And about my city, Isfahan, I should say uh, Isfahan located in the center of Iran. Isfahan is the heart of countries, business and industrial network. The city is filled with cultural heritage and uh, cityscape harmonies, mix of historical uh, vestige and uh, modern design uh, composes a uh, uniquely attractive and uh, convenient environment. Zion Rouge River and its historical bridge in the middle of the city has doubled the charm of the city. And uh, also my cities are surrounded by mountain, mountains, uh, which provides outdoor and uh, cultural activities all year round. Uh, the blend of energetic city and uh, refreshing nature allows guests to enjoy a versatile lifestyle in Isfahan. And I'm looking forward to uh, meet uh, you in Isfahan and see you in Isfahan. And also, please uh, move to other slides to share some uh, maybe stunning uh, cultural uh, building and historical building of Isfahan. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nafise, for this great talk. I was really uh, surprised by your great uh, results. Uh, yeah. And we can ask uh, questions if there are any. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. We can go further to the question and answer part of the uh, webinar. Uh, Miriam, uh, there is one question directed to you, if I can ask. Yeah. What guidance would you offer to young women who are aspiring to pursue a career in immunology, but may encounter challenges in their journey? <laughs> well, it's a very difficult question, of course, uh, because um, you know some people are more in control of what they can do than others. Uh, but I would say something that I say always to uh immunologist um for example in in, um, in the arab world where i that i visit often is that it's very important to well first to 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 believe in in yourself you know the the the, the problem with uh, you know this expansion of knowledge we feel intimidated by knowledge you know and are convinced that people in different parts of the world have all the means and you know, what can we do and how we can contribute. And that's not true. I realize that if you really believe in your capacity and with all the knowledge that is now uh, uh, available online and you can, uh, and if you are serious and rigorous, um, then you can really develop. So if you really want to become a serious immunologist, uh, then the first thing is to read. There is tons of material, you know, available. And then, the second part is to reach out to someone that can mentor you, someone that you respect and that can mentor you. And iOS really um, is maybe a platform to really do that. You know, we are starting a program where we will match hopefully immunologists uh, from different parts of the world with the more established scientists in uh, places that have more uh, infrastructure and means. And, and hopefully this type of exchange can help guide you. So, 
uh, I am hoping that the IOS can uh, facilitate the career of women immunologists throughout the world. But otherwise, I will suggest you also really reach out within your environment to someone that you respect and then uh, uh, really discuss you know, your interest in the field. But, but what's very important is uh, seriousness, right? So because we, you know, often I, I hear of interest, you know, of, of uh, students, not only in, in, you know, different parts of the world, including in, in, in my community, you know, of American students. And sometimes, you know, uh, 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 trainees think they are interested, but it's unclear whether they are. So it's important to, to really first assess your interest in science. And if you are certain of it, then you have to work for it. And if you work uh, very hard, people recognize, at least there is a community of scientists that will recognize that effort and really help you through this. But it has to come first from you. And this is the difficult part. This is what I tell my kids all the time. You know, you have to be disciplined and you have to have the stamina you know, so maintain that discipline for a prolonged period of time. And people and established people recognize, you know, your interest. And I often touched by it. And there will be people that, that will help you. And this is what happened to me many times where I felt the lost and the, but but if you continue to fight, there are always people who will help. Okay, thank you very much. I think Nushin want to announce Thanks the a prizes. Uh, yes. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. You see it now? Yes, we can see. Okay, so we have two. Um, first of all, thanks a lot to all the speakers. Um, and uh, now we have two um, two awards. Uh, I let uh, Melnaz introduce uh, the award for Nafize, uh, if you want. Uh, yeah, I explained uh, in my introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, Nafize sent an application together with nine, eight other scientists, and she was selected to give a lecture today, uh, which was really great. Yeah. Okay, and so we, yes. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, an honorary award uh, for Minou Ad uh, Adib. She's uh, Iranian and French. And um, I let uh, Beazine Combadier to uh, introduce um, uh, briefly uh, the work of uh, Minou that unfortunately um, uh, died recently. Um, thank you, Nushin. I'm very uh, actually. It's it's a lot of emotion that I'm I'm giving this talk, and I wasn't thinking that I was going to cry by. <laughs> that, but I, 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 so I'm very honored to be here to to pay tribute to memory of Minu Adi. Minu, she was a brilliant scientist and immunologist. Uh, she really left her mark at the Pasteur Institute in Iran, and. Uh, so she completed actually her primary school in uh, Razi. Uh, so she was speaking fluently French when she arrived in, in Paris and she obtained with honors her baccalaureate in the field of biology. And then she, she continued um, at the University Paris Descartes, so it's Paris Jussieu. And this is where I met Minou. It's the first day of the first year of the university. She was sitting next to me and, uh, and having a name like Minou Adib, you cannot be, uh, less than Iranian. So I asked her whether she was Iranian. She said yes. And I said, oh, I was so happy actually to have an Iranian uh, friend here. And uh, we actually um, uh, stay at the Pasteur Institute together at the master's degree. And she uh, she actually started in Stanislas Avramea's laboratory uh, where she did her PhD. And she was one of the first people working on monoclonal antibodies, uh, autoantibodies that we can obtain after polyclonal activation of B cells. So you cannot be more immunologist that started by working on, on IgG and IgM autoantibodies um, and, and autoantibodies. 
So, um, and then she joined the Jean-Marc Cavaillon unit and she, be she became a pastorian. And I think it's a privilege um, than an Iranian woman being a pastorian uh, in Paris. She devoted her research on innate immunity and particular focus on sepsis. And I remember that when COVID uh, appeared and COVID is a viral uh, sepsis, we actually went back to me newspaper reading everything about um, about uh, what she her work she has done on macrophages, natural killer cells during sepsis and activation of the cytokines. And we learned that actually while she was working on bacterial infections, uh, in COVID infection, we find again those those markers uh, during a COVID sepsis. Uh, and, and then she, uh, she actually uh, published more than 80 publications uh, during her time at the Pasteur Institute. And, um, and she remained until the end of her life as a positive mindset and belief in science and medicine uh, that can save lives. And actually uh, the medicine that helped, uh, helped her to fight against the disease for, for years and years. So it's, it's very, um, um, it's in honoring her remarkable path in immunology. Uh, I'm happy that we can recognize today not only a scientist, but a woman, Iranian woman, uh, working hardly in, in uh, medicine to save lives. Thank you. Many thanks. I was on the way to cry also. Huh? I'm sorry. <laughs> so, merci. Uh, so, Nushin getting emotional. She's speaking French now. <laughs> National Day Woman in Science again. Yeah, and, um, is, yeah I'm going uh, to present the winner ah, sorry, of the, the photographic winner. contest. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. a little bit slow so this is the a photographic contest i will present a clip from almost all photos we received not all but almost all we had some limitation in presenting all So the winners, we have a uh, top three winners, uh, Nazila Alizadeh, she has PhD in immunology uh, and works in immunology research center in Tabriz University of Medical Sciences. The other winner is uh, Behnaz uh, Bazrafshan, she's a PhD candidate in molecular medicine uh, in Golestan University of Medical Sciences and Masume Atarie, she's a gynecologist from Bubble University of Medical Sciences. Uh, I congratulate uh, these three winners and please ne next slide and thank to all who contributed to the to our con uh, contest and in appreciation of uh, their contribution and enthusiasm, we will award everybody uh, took for who took part in this contest with this beautiful mark. In one side, you can see the logo of our gender equality community. And on the other side, there is a nice quote from, uh, uh, from Maya Angelou. She's, a, she's an American writer. 
uh, emphasizing how important it is for us to recognize and celebrate our heroes and sheroes. So we will send this beautiful mark to everybody who uh, took part in this contest and also a gift card for the three top winners. Next slide, please. At this uh, time, I would like to thank my great team, the Gender Equality Community Team, uh, Marjan, Reza, and Milad, who are MSc students of immunology, Mariam, uh, who is a MSc student of medical genetics, and Fatima, uh, who is an uh, MSc graduate of immunology, and Hasbi, who is a high school student. Uh, I'm really thankful uh, to all of them. They are really passionate and enthusiastic, and uh, anything you see today is from their efforts. Uh, next, please. And also, I would like to thank Monir, who presented the history of immunology and women immunologists today. She gathered, really, she tried hard to gather this information and present today. And finally, last but not least, I want to thank everybody, next slide please, who helped us to organize this webinar today, Iranian Society of Immunology, French Society of Immunology, the gender equality community that I mentioned now, KIT group uh, for doing logistics of this uh, webinar, especially Mitra, Lina, and Michelle uh, for social media, and also IOIS junior community, uh, Nushin and Lina. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for being with us uh, in celebration of this great day. Thank you. Thank you.